and um, work, working with uh, Eastern Shore Land Conservancy. We do have a little poll that we um, are hoping people will have a chance to take. It just gives us a sense of who's in the room um, and kind of what you're interested in. So let's see if I can get that going. All right, hopefully folks are seeing that now. If you don't see the poll and you wanna just um, mention in chat, assuming you have access to that, um, kind of what role best describes your reason for being here today, whether you're a farmer, wanna become a farmer, maybe you're a farm service provider, whatever it is about you that's relevant to today's Lunch and Learn. And then um, kind of what soil health and regenerative ag opportunities you're interested in learning more about. Those are the questions we're looking to get a little more information on today. Huh. I'll let that poll keep going as I um, continue. On this slide, some of what you're going to see is the work of the Million Acre Challenge or the um, opportunities that we are hoping to bring to regional farmers. Um, our soil health benchmarking study, which was headed up by PASA, uh, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Ag, and Lisa Garfield here in Maryland. Um, is working with farms to uh, provide soil testing and indicators that go beyond kind of a basic soil test. Um, some really good uh, data being aggregated there. Um, we are also, even as we speak, working um, on farmer to farmer networking as we bring farmers together on farm and remotely to try to establish more ways for folks to be learning from one another. We are assisting farmers with practice implementation and working towards economic case studies so that uh, you all know what the bottom line is um, when you're working towards soil health practices. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our poll. It looks like we have, um, interesting, so far I don't see any other farmers in the room, but we have a lot of folks who want to become farmers, um, folks who want to um, look into academic uh, research kinds of topics. We have some farm service providers and we have some others. So welcome to all of you for, uh, it's nice to, nice to have you with us. All right, let's see if we can. Quick PSA, um, we do encourage folks to go ahead and enroll in the Million Acre Challenge, but that is a role for farmers. So those of you who aren't farmers, please listen out for other ways that you can engage with this project. Farmers on the call or far folks who expect to become farmers and are already um, managing land can find the enrollment link on our webpage. Um, the second Wednesday of every month, we do these uh, lunch and learns called Soil Health to Go. So go ahead and make a placeholder on your calendar for November's second Wednesday. We do also send out a monthly newsletter and that's what that QR code is there. If you wanna point your phone camera at that, it'll bring you to our most recent newsletter, which just came out uh, a couple of days ago. Feel free to follow us on social media on all of those linked uh, opportunities there. And Lisa and I are also available at the email addresses that you see at the bottom of your screen. We're getting closer. Here's, here's, uh, here's my chance to talk a little bit about my friend, Bob Miller, who I have known for a lot of years and I'm really lucky because he's here on the Eastern shore where I live. And that means that I can go to my local grocery store and buy his products. So um, I feel, feel very honored to have that opportunity. Bob is a third generation dairy farmer. His parents um, were very interested in the Jersey breed, the A2A2 breed. Bob is gonna tell us more about how he's taking that um, even further in his tenure as farm steward. He took full ownership of the farm in 2019. The farm is 200 acres, 120 of them in permanent pasture. He stewards 40 Jersey cows. Um, let's see, Bob, you're at three farmer's markets. You do commercial sales and home delivery. Right. I think that's right. All right. Now is when I turn the talking stick over to Bob and I get to take a little breather um, and he gets to tell us about um, his operation and what he knows and loves the best, which are his cows. 
and I'm going to see if I can adjust the camera just a tiny bit so you get a slightly better view of Bob. But oh, no. Bob, you can you can you can start chit chatting about uh, your your first loves here, these beautiful Jersey cows. Yes. Well, good uh, happy noon to everyone, and thanks for for tuning in. So the Jersey cow is something that's very important to to us, and in 2019, the uh, when we when I took over from my parents. Uh, we were not an all Jersey herd. It was a crossbred herd. Um, and on my own research and talking with customers over the years, you know, efficiency, sustainability was something just as important as the quality of the milk to them. And you can't really get a more efficient uh, dairy cow other than, than the Jersey cow. She is the solution for a sustainability in dairy. They use fewer resources. They have a smaller carbon footprint longer productive life and are excellent grazers. And to put a little bit of numbers to that, 32% less water use from, from a Jersey, 11% less land and less waste, and therefore less fossil fuel use. And that's just her. And then when you get to her milk, uh, you have a much more nutrient rich milk, 15 to 20% more protein in all Jersey milk, 15 to 18% more calcium, 10 to 12% more phosphorus, higher levels of B12, which is an essential vitamin. And then if you're looking at what you can do with the Jersey milk, cheese makers, and even a lot of our, our people are, that buy our milk will make cheese at home. You get 25% more yield from all Jersey milk. And if you're making butter like, like we do, you get 30% more, more butter. And that's, that's just the general milk. The A2A2 thing is something that's been it's been going on for a bit. It's relatively new science, um, but basically there's two proteins in milk and in a nutshell, the A2 protein is more digestible for more people. So you have less, uh, less problems when you're digesting the milk. Many Jersey cows are A2, A2 cows. Um, you have to test individually and then you have to breed for it after that, which is what we've done. But in those, in that three and a half year period that since we've, I've taken over the whole farming piece in addition to the creamery. We have gotten a 100% A2, A2 herd. So, um, so that's the one-two punch of Jersey greatness there. So just to recap for those of you um, who may have issues with digesting dairy products, there's a chance that products from um, a cow like the ones that um, get to live at Nice Farms Creamery um, would be more um, more accessible to your digestive system, right? right. Um, not to mention higher in all kinds of nutrients and um, a really efficient cow. Um, it's funny, we don't think about our livestock so much as being efficient, but it really is an important component of the bottom line, uh, converting Absolutely. converting all that good grass to the, the product that you're going to be selling. Absolutely. Um, um, and one, there's a wonderful book if, for more information on the A2A2 thing. It's called The Devil in the Milk, and it's written by a New Zealander. And that's where a lot of this research has come from, New Zealand and Australia. Okay. So it's called The Devil in the Milk. Check it out. Um, I think the, the author does an excellent job of explaining, you know, the, the A2 protein and why it's better for you. Cool. Um, I'll pause here just long enough to say that as you have questions come to mind, feel free to put them in chat. You can also just sort of jump in, but we do uh, sort of fire hose through the information and have a little more time towards the end to get at some more detailed questions if you don't feel like you can jump in live um, in the moment. So Bob, your cows are um, roaming around on 120 acres of permanent pasture. Um, we hear the term grass fed a lot, but I'd love to give you the opportunity to talk about what that means and how you manage your cows on the pasture that they're on. Well, you know, grass fed to us means actually having the cows out on, on pasture uh, for as, as much of the year we'll tolerate. Now we do live in Maryland. Um, there's at least three summers and, and, and two falls and five springs in Maryland. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, we like to have our cows out roughly uh, where they're, they're outside from March all the way through uh, post Thanksgiving, if, if possible. And that we don't, you know, while, while we do, you know, we do make hay on the dairy, but the cows themselves are the ones that are that are that are feeding themselves on a rotational pasture scheme. So we don't mechanically harvest 
grasses and forages and then you know make a tmr out of it and then feed it to the cows in a big barn all the time that's that's not what they do the, these cows are out and and grazing uh on various pastures throughout throughout the year and they're they're constantly moving around the dairy now depending on the situation and the weather i mean you might have to you know keep them indoors out of the sun under fans for some of the heat of the day but by you know by and large from march through um like I said, post Thanksgiving, they're going to be out and about. And our our cows are rarely confined, even in the dead of the winter. They're able to come in, uh, go out, and and eat. So, um, but that's what grass fed and, and rotational grazing means to us. Um. So, just uh, Bob and I were actually talking about this this morning, and I've never been um, somebody who has been in charge of cattle, um, let alone dairy cattle. So. I think it's interesting to note that just because a product is labeled grass-fed, uh, it doesn't mean that it's this kind of grass-based model, which is truly animals on grass as many months of the year as um, is safe for them, sure. um, right? And that they have enough food to eat. Absolutely. Um, so how do you get your pastures in prime condition for cows to be uh, making their, you know, their getting their full diets off of you. I know you're doing some soil testing. Right, we do work with uh, the soil testing. We're working on older from when my parents were, you know, you have like three years for your nutrient management stuff. Uh, but one of the things that I'm looking at closely would be the pH and some of the soil. Some of the parts of the farm seems to be creeping in the, in the more acidic side of it, which isn't conducive to excellent, you know, you know, grasses and such. So that's, that's one thing that we're we're watching very closely is the pH when we start taking our next round of testing over the over the winter time, is just to see where exactly the pH is. Um, but yeah, we haven't really tilled a lot, you know. Over, you know, we've been at that property since 1989. So since then, the tilling has gone, you know, down, um, and so a lot of the nutrients and stuff are already kind of in place. Um, but the pH is something that I think would be the number one thing we're looking at right now. Sorry, I'm clicking and, and, and uh, changing my slide unnecessarily. So I don't know that we have um, audio on this particular video, but hopefully you're going to get a glimpse here of um, Bob in action. And Bob, tell us what you're what you're doing in this video here. Well, this is a relatively recent video. This is um, this is me with our um, Great Plains no chill drill. Um, as you can see by the size of our equipment, I mean, this is, this is small, you know, we don't have huge, powerful tractors. We don't need it. We don't need a lot of big tillage stuff. We don't, we don't need it. You know, with this, this most little drill here, 75 horsepower tractor is all to go. And what you're seeing is we're putting in triticale, depending on how you say it, into a millet, um, and yeah, which has, has sprouted since we've taken this uh, video. But as you can see, you know, we're taking advantage of those annual paddocks that have been heavily grazed um, with nutrients from the cows, and we're just drilling right in behind it with the uh, with the spring. So we never take anything off the, the soil. You know, you don't have to worry about any uh, wind or rain erosion. You know, there's still a root system there, and there's a lot of volunteer things in there. If you look closely, you'll see clovers, the, uh, crabgrass things that have been growing in, you know, and so to protect the soil, we like to keep that um, in it and just rely on the drill to get that into the, um, into the ground. Yeah, so not tilling, keeping the roots intact, keeping the cover intact. Um, how do you decide what you're going to put in in the way of annuals? Well, I, um, we have come up over the years, mom and dad have tried many things, and I think what works with us really well is the triticale in the spring, and and millet in in the summer, millet in, and both triticale and millet are very safe um, safe forages to plant because you don't have to worry about things like prussic acid. Mm -hmm. So a lot of guys will try to use you know sedan grasses and mm -hmm. and that can actually kill your cows if you're not if you're not careful. And if you do get like with the millet's case, if you get drought like we had some drought this year, you know the millet's good no matter what height it is. And after something's been grazed, you're gonna usually get some unevenness. And if that was sedan grass, you might have some of it that's perfect, at a good safe height, but then a bunch of it that isn't. And you have to like, well, can I graze it? Is it safe? 
And so we take all that thinking out of it and we know that we can just put them out and not have to worry about uh, problems with, with things like prussic acid. So, and a lot of what else is happening in the pasture that we see here are perennial kinds mm -hmm. of plants. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, so, you know, since we don't really till um, and, and, and completely go from a clean slate, you know, you're getting a lot of volunteer stuff. And we do have perennial pastures, too. So only only uh, and, th and they need to be reseeded from time to time. But the perennial pastures are, are, are basically, you know, you have orchard grasses and, and fescue. Now I'm trying to get more endophyte free fescue in over, because I think back in the day, they used a lot of Kentucky 31, mm. which has endophytes and that's not always the best uh, during the growing season for cows. If you stockpile it and graze it in the winter or fall, it's better, but we're trying to get more endophyte free varieties in. But then we also have a lot of volunteer stuff like hairy vetch in the spring just comes up without without us having to do anything. And then crabgrass in the summer, which was really helpful this summer because it grows well in, in, in drought. So without rambling on, we're, we're trying to do multiple things. Um, it's always interesting to me to hear um, uh, when a livestock producer uh, is talking about things like crabgrass as a positive. Anybody yes. who's, who's dealing with lawns would be thinking of it as a negative. Um, so nice to shed new light on those plants. So um, on the left hand side of this uh, slide, you can see some of how Nice Farms Creamery is using paddock systems to mm -hmm. um, uh, keep their cows into in a more um, confined area and then move them to another one that's not been um, so heavily grazed. But you do have times when you're having to feed um, things that aren't coming straight off the pasture. So right. tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, one of our big things that we we do feed, you know, hay um, and, and we can on a good year grow a decent amount of hay and, and not really have to purchase anything, which is which is nice. But I mean, unfortunately, this year, uh, I only got two cuttings and I, we pretty much have fed all of that already because in so late, late in July through all of August, you know, was just a lot of hay uh, going into the cows because we're trying to protect the grass. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, damage the grass. So, you know, we put the cows on sacrifice lots, you know, and almost, it was almost like a second winter uh, this year for about six to eight weeks. And then wintertime, well, what a great segue. <laughs> But but again, there's proof that the cows are not purely uh, you know in, confined, and we we let them go out all the time. Actually, you know, cows do prefer it a little cooler than we do, and this is kind of a nice um, a nice picture showing them how much they they can they can thrive and even in cold weather. So I think yeah, this is a ne our next video. Um, Bob has explained is uh, captures the cows when they're just being sent back out to pasture after a winter, right. um, after some time indoors in the winter. And I just love how incredibly excited they are. So I'll see if I can get this one to play. Again, I'm afraid the sound isn't coming through, but you get the idea. So these girls here, you know, after just, after Thanksgiving or so, the, the them rotating through the farm doesn't happen as much. Generally, December, all the way through, this is like the third week of March. Everyone's excited because it means a lot less work for us too. But this is them coming on to that beautiful triticale that this is what hopefully next next March will look like. But you see them, they're they're very happy to be out there. They, they're just excited. And they're them just going to town on it. Um, so excited to be out there again. Some slow motion action. And there's some, you know, there's some dot. You see, so it's not just pure triticale. There's other things in there and the cows are eating Down it. in the lower right. I guess, yeah. So, but that's a wonderful example of our, of our rotational uh, grazing system in action. Uh, I do wish you guys could hear the chomping noise <laughs> that's happening in slow motion here. That's pretty cool. And that changes the milk too. You'll go from a, a you know, the milk will pale out in color uh, through the winter, but once we start hitting grass like that again in the spring, you'll just see that butter get very yellow and um, the milk get very so so we are doing really good on time um i think this gives us an opportunity now and and um sort of the whole point of work of the million acre challenge and the work that nice farms creamery is doing under the stewardship of the miller family is um to move towards regeneration so 
I'd like to give Bob a chance to just talk about kind of what what do regenerative practices mean to you, um, and how what does that how does that play out on the farm? Well, I think you know when I when I think of regenerative, you know, one of the things that first things is just using less of everything, you know, and and it starts with the type of cow that we have, the Jersey cow, more efficient, uses less to make you know, a good amount of milk, it's got a lot of nutrients in it, um, less fuel, you know, so we don't have to use the tractors uh, that we have as much because we don't need to do a lot of- um, It depends of on the size of the cheese. <laughs> They're gonna be uh, mostly at 10 to 12. The other thing I would say, um, you know, it's it's allowing the farm to kind of, you know, you're, you're managing more than actually um, stepping in and, and, and doing everything. So you're letting nature kind of take care of itself. Um, and you see that with our fields, you know, a lot of guys are like, um, wow, you know, that's not a pure stand of, of, of triticale or, or millet. I'm like, no, it's not. But like I was told once a long time ago that if a cow eats it and makes milk, is it a weed? And, and it isn't. And so, you know, we, we take advantage of, of the things that are growing automatically um, on their own voluntarily. And then the other thing, you know, the farm, you know, it almost looks like a park, you know, the, it's it's beyond the, just the dairy herd and the operation that's there. But, you know, you, you have a robust amount of, of wildlife, you know, waterfowl, um, you know, your deer, your turkey, in the soil, the soil is alive. You know, there's a lot of wonderful, you know, our, our dung beetle population is very high in the Salisbury University came out a few years ago, some students were doing like a research project and we had than anywhere else because of the fact that get plowed and disc up all the time and we don't spray anything on the field or, you know, we use very little stuff on the cows themselves. So it's much healthier, for, you know, there. and that's, and that's what it all means. It means, you know, just kind of like, you know, you just push play and just watch it happen. And that's kind of like what we're doing, but we're just, you know, we're just taking, uh, working with it more so than looking. And then I guess there you are. So <laughs> the field mouse. So uh, I I snagged this photo off the Nice Farms Creamery Facebook page because, I mean, gosh, adorable little soggy mouse there. But what I really appreciated was what was written about it um, in where in the author talked about kind of how regenerative is more than just how you treat the land necessarily it it involves the whole farm right the whole farm and and this is a wonderful example this i guess this mouse was noticed hello, hello. and was saved you have an appointment but, <laughs> but we really, what I'm talking about. this is how we're going to miss a point and let me get sorry i can't I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out how to mute i think we're good all right carry on cool but you know but you get an idea of it's just more than just you know just focusing on milk, you know, you're focusing on everything and then you're allowing nature to kind of take its course there. So we're really glad to be able to do that. And it's very important to us. And, and, and quite honestly, without all the support, you know, we just would not be happening. So. Um, right. Which is actually another component, I think, of regeneration. So if we, if we are coming to the concept of this through the lens of leaving um, whatever it is you're involved with better than how you found it. You're regenerating it. You're not just sustaining what's there, you're improving and you're regenerating what's there. And of course that needs to also um, translate down to the kinds of foods that we eat, the um, food system that we all depend upon. Um, and in order to have um, small farmers like Nice Farms Creamery, uh, <laughs> So definitely. Let's see, I think we're coming just coming to the end here. Uh, maybe a couple more slides. So this is the um, I've learned a little bit of the tip of the iceberg of the Nice Farms Creamery plan. Uh, tell us about this. Bob. Well, you know, it it is a true family farm, and you know, we we know are the ones that are that are doing a lot of the work. You know, so um, you know, we do have additional people that help us out for sure. But uh, myself, all the way. Why can I only hear out of one ear? To the little guys is um, okay. so 
on our farm, you know, the kids are very involved. Um, you know, we have um, soon to be 16 year old all the way down to, uh, you know, soon to be three year olds. And the vast majority of them, except for the, even the, even the littlest ones are, are still out in, into the dairy uh, while we're milking and stuff. But, you know, especially the, the three are older girls there. And that's two out of the three of them that, that looks like Mary and Aria, but Anna, Mary, Aria, they're the ones that are taking care of all the, the younger stocks that we're talking about newborns up to about a year, these animals are under their constant care. And then uh, John being the oldest, you know, he certainly does a lot of the utility tractor work and things like that. And, and uh, you know, you know, he, he works, uh, you know, it's kind of like a second me on, on some of that respect. <laughs> um, and, you know, and they're all, it teaches them responsibility. It teaches them, you know, a lot of the stuff that we believe in that we're talking about right now, you know, is, is this kind of farming. They don't understand the big row farming stuff because we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, and this, so this is a great way to, for us to regenerate ourselves, I think, and, uh, and keeping that going. Um, and, and they're very, you know, your, your, your future, your legacy really are your children. Yeah. yeah. This picture keeps getting bumped out. Okay. Let's see how we're doing here. Um, yeah, so this brings us to the end of the of the formal part of our um, presentation. And since some of you may be hopping off right at 1230, I want to make sure that we thank you for being here and thank Bob for being here. But we also usually stick around for another 15 minutes or so to answer any questions you might have and just to kind of get the conversation a little more opened up. So you're welcome to stay on for that. Um, if you have time and interest in doing so. Uh, I would encourage, if you can stay, that folks come on camera so that we have some faces to put with the names that we see on our screens. And if you joined um, after we were inviting folks to put that information in chat, feel free to do that, just your name and kind of what brings you to the Lunch and Learn today. But uh, let me just open the floor up for questions. Anybody have anything that they're um, interested in asking Bob or uh, anybody else that they see in the room? I'd like to answer or ask a question. Sure thing. Um, so hello, I'm gonna put my video on. <laughs> can you guys see me? We can. All right, my name's Amanda Miller. I'm at Chesapeake Gold Farms up in Northeast Maryland. We're actually a dairy that's producing uh, cheese, yogurt, and butter as well. Um, but we're a conventional dairy where we're doing uh, corn, soy. Um, we do triticale, cover crops, all that as well, but we're just more of a conventional dairy. Um, I was late getting onto the call. Were you a conventional dairy before this or have you always been grass fed? Since we moved from New Jersey to Maryland, um, the, the grazing uh, pasture has been increasingly important to what we've been doing. So when I, I was a little guy when we moved from New Jersey to, to here. And one of the main reasons why my parents moved was because they that farm was a rented farm and they wanted to get into grazing um, then. And so um, they wanted to find their own place. Um, and that's why we moved to Maryland. So I think we grew corn on the dairy for the first like couple of years. Uh, and then after that, we, we haven't grown any corn silage since. And the old bunker silos that were on the dairy were, were, were taken, taken down and dismantled. So. Uh, that's, it was, uh, it was something that, that occurred when I was very young, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, that was kind of what I was going to ask was if you were doing corn and conventional crops, um, kind of what was that transition like? And then uh, also, is your parlor a different uh, setup as well? Because a lot of the grazing dairies I've witnessed um, and been to our swing parlor, and I didn't know what kind of parlor you guys were using. We actually milk in an old flat stanchion barn uh, we we use it like a parlor i mean we bring in a certain amount of cows at a time and and, and cycle through milking that way uh but yeah i mean and i will say i mean you guys are used to you know it is tricky you will have more problems um managing the cows because you know the cows these days are not like the cows 100 years ago even you know they they are being as you very well know are being bred for production and things and if they're not if you're not careful, you know, you can have a lot of metabolic issues uh, with grazing. Um, you know, it's something that will require a lot more, I think, attention. So just, 
you know, obviously, I mean, I've, I've know of you guys reputation and such, so you're excellent dairy people, but you know, if you were to do that, just be, just remember, you know, you're going to have those cows are going to have to adjust to not having that ration mm -hmm. and you will, you will, you know, you will have lower and inconsistent milk production. That was my next. She's still here. question and the genetics were really different um so did mm -hmm. you guys buy in like heritage breed cattle of the jerseys or were these u.s genetics so a lot of the our foundation uh herd was kind of like what my parents my parents were not um pure jersey people so we're kind of that transition is still is still going on um and um because the Jersey cows that I have are largely U.S. genetics, um, but we are incorporating Australian and New Zealand genetics um, as we speak. So we're looking to see how that will mitigate some of those some of those things. But the uh, if you guys are milking more Holsteins and such, um, you know, you might want to think about that again as you're if you are going to transition into grazing more. So um, awesome! Thank you so much. Yeah, take Thank care. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thanks. Other questions? I don't think we talked a lot about uh, the products that Nice Farms Creamery uh, puts out there. So maybe somebody would like to know more about that um, or something else. Hi, I don't have a products question. My name is Evan. I'm not a farmer yet, but I'm currently looking into getting into it. I'm curious around your soil health testing protocol year over year. How do you decide when to do it? When do you do it? Kind of how do you keep track of that process? Well, here in Maryland, are you from Maryland or? Yeah, I'm from Maryland. I'm looking at getting started in Frederick County a little bit to the east of Frederick. Okay. Well, you know, as you know, there's a lot of nutrient management stuff. So a lot of the uh, soil samples, um, I think there's a a, a timeline that you have to maintain. I think it's like every three years you have to, to keep your nutrient management plan up. So, so we definitely go with that. Honestly, it's observation. You know, like if something, like I've noticed a couple of fields, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things um, not being as prolific as I think they should. So definitely, you know, don't be afraid. I mean, a lot of times I, I'm, I'm constantly walking around the farm. So just look and see, how things are growing. That's your number one thing right there. Things aren't, aren't growing the way that you think they should be, you know, certainly um, if you're just getting into it and you're, and you're, you know, I don't know if you have property already or you're looking at getting property, I would definitely take samples right away. That way, you know what you got, you know, for sure. But somebody like myself that, you know, we've been farming it for, for a while, you know, I would think definitely um, observation would be your number two. And then of course, you're going to have to take samples anyway, being in Maryland. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> I've got another question if nobody else does. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> um, you said you, for, as for products, you're doing uh, milk and eggnog. Is that HTST or are you doing um, like slow time yeah. pasteurization? So we, we are the slow time pasteurization people and with your herd size and volume, you might want to look in that, um, and that other, pro, uh, other methods, uh, that pasteurization does take time. Um, and I think it works for our yeah. size, you know, but, uh, an HCSC, you know, it, it is faster, um, you know, in that respect. So, um, but I like that pasteurization. I'm, I'm a big VAT pasteurization guy. So let me actually give Bob if only ever. Let me give Bob a chance to say where his products can be found for folks who might be on the yeah. shop side and then come back in with your follow-up question. So, um, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of the peninsula. So anywhere about an hour or so around us is what we, we feel we should really be marketing to. I mean, if I have to sell milk throughout the mid-Atlantic, I feel like I, I would be doing something wrong. So, you know, Chestertown, Centerville, Denton, you know, Easton, Cambridge, Salisbury, um, in, in Annapolis, Maryland. If you live in those areas and, and central Delaware, you know, Lewis and, and, and in Greenwood, um, yeah, then we could, we could certainly be your dairy. And you're at the Annapolis Farmer's Market. Right. Annapolis uh, Farmer's Lewis, Market. 
Lewis Farmers Market, Salisbury, um, Salisbury Camden Avenue Farmers Market, and uh, we're also Chestertown on, on Farmers Markets on Saturday, too. So, so no excuses, you know, if you're coming over towards the eastern shore from farther in western Maryland, um, make a make a special effort to get to one of those markets. Um, or here in Talbot County, we have Grouse Market that sells um, nice farms creamery products right off the grocery store shelf, which we love. Yes, they're great. Um, one more. You had another question. I cut you off before. Hi, yeah. My only other question was, um, I've never had your milk before. And I was just wondering, um, I've heard like there's a difference in taste with the low temp longer pasteurization, like a little bit more of a cooked milk taste. And I was just wondering if you'd ever seen that or thought no, that there was I, I mean, I think when you pasteurize milk, you know, um, I think that the way that we do it on our dairy, um, there's a mitigation. So I, I grew up drinking raw milk, of course, you know, all, off the farm. And one of the biggest concerns I had when, when we started the creamery back in 2009 was, was screwing up the milk. <laughs> And I think um, I'm very happy with the way that we do it. And I think it's in, a, it's in balance. So if you're going to, if you're going to have a smaller herd like we are, I think the chances of, of the milk being um, less tampered with uh, our, I should say that cooked flavor that you're talking about, I think you could do it. And, uh, but I, I would say like with anything, if you scale it up more and more and more, you're going to have to do different processes. And I think you're going to have a, a, a milk that's going to taste more conventional. That Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Good question. I was going to give Bob a shameless plug. I'm a researcher at the University of Maryland, but I've oh. been a customer since he started. And the process they use and the milk that they deliver is by far greater than anything we ever have and when we're, we're forced to go to the grocery store it's almost unpalatable well i mean milk thank you very much sir for your support i mean people like yourself are what are keeping the dairy farm going um you know i can't i can't thank you enough and uh, they're very kind words and we do a lot of things differently we also admit a lot of things and i think that's that's the big deal and i also think just being bold enough not to grow to a point where you're going to become like everybody else. I think staying genuine and true to um, your size of land that you have and, and just keeping it local, I think is, is really what separates us from a lot of other uh, options out there. And thank you for noticing, sir. Speaking from personal experience, I buy a gallon of Nice Farms Creamery milk about every two weeks and turn it into yogurt. Um, so I, um, cause there's only two people in my household these days. Um, but I, uh, have a long abiding relationship with the nice farms premiered products. So let's see, there's milk whole and right. so we have whole milk and skimmed milk. We have, um, let's see our yogurt line. Uh, we have, you know, the chocolate milk, which is really, really famous. We do make eggnog seasonally. Um, let's see, there's other things like half and half. Our butter is amazing. Um, what am I ice saying? cream. Yeah. Ice cream. Don't forget. Yeah. Right. Well, it's starting <laughs> to get cold. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, but ice cream, our ice cream is great. It's made from scratch. Um, let's see. Um, we have buttermilk now, which is something we're really excited about. So if you like buttermilk, I would highly recommend it. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much a lot of the main stuff. That's I'm on the spot now. I'm, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good list. <laughs> Coffee drinks. Oh, yep. that's right, Lisa. Very good. The nice brews. They're they're it's they're called nice brews. They're really good. The they're coffee drinks. It's like we made a latte in the creamery and then and bottle it and now get it to you. Really? Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa's great, everyone. Um, other questions? I think we have time for a couple more if somebody has more that they are interested in asking about. What Christmas tree you can't audio I know. Well, great um, question. Go ahead. Bob, I'm curious if you have considered um, silva pasture or hedgerows or any other kind of uh, practices on the farm that, you know, now that you've reached kind of equilibrium uh, in your rotation plan, are there other kind of next steps that you're interested in 
implementing? Well, I, I think, um, you know, we do have um, right before a few years before, you know, they left, uh, they did plant some some additional trees around. So there is some of that silva pasturing going on in some ways. And especially if it gets warm, you can see the cows will definitely kind of get out of the sun down there, which is which is a good thing. Um, but the hedgerow thing, I think, would be very interesting. You know, it'd be awesome to get away from fencing, um, you know, and have like a like a green fence. Um, but I will admit, I mean, we we are going through, and all of us are, I know, it's been, um, these last couple of years, there's been a lot of rising costs and and things. And right now we're, we're really just trying to hold on um, and just keep keep kind of going. I mean, um, just just to be perfectly honest with you, I, I think I think that is something um, survival is really the front part of my mind. Uh, I think there's a good base system. But looking forward, I think a little bit more trees would be nice. And then, you know, I, I'm intrigued about the hedgerow thing. So that's something that I was actually thinking about because jerseys are very curious and they get themselves into trouble sometimes. <laughs> All right, folks uh, who are still in the audience, if you have thoughts that follow this session, feel free to reach out to me or Lisa via email, which are at the bottom of the slide that's on display right now, or um, through any of our social media channels, we encourage you to go ahead and like and follow us, even though that's, uh, you know, we, we're not begging for likes, but we do, that's the best way for us to keep up with folks on a regular basis. Same is true for Nice Farms. They have a really vibrant Facebook page. Right. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you interacting with us and with um, regional regenerative farmers in every way that you can. And uh, yeah, we're grateful for today and have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone.